Hello and welcome to Reese Ryan Writes, <laughs> where authors and readers connect. <laughs> I am Reese Ryan, author of sexy contemporary romantic fiction. And my half of my head is missing off of this. <laughs> I'm starting to go on the wrong way. Um, sexy romantic contemporary fiction featuring family drama, a cast of um, complicated characters and surprising secrets. And mm -hmm. as you can see today, my guest is Vanessa Riley. I am so excited because this is where authors and readers connect and we're connecting with Vanessa today. And so if you've been in romance land yet at all, you have seen her gorgeous cover for her book, A Duke, The Lady and a Baby. <laughs> Thank you for holding it up. <laughs> it's, this um, is like left, right, right, left. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? That's always something to worry about. So we know, and this, and this, it's so funny that we're talking historical romance because normally I'm always doing contemporary, and it's fitting that we're doing historical because Hamilton premieres today <laughs> on Disney, which of course I did not know, realize at the time when I created it, um, but. That is fantastic. So we just probably moved it up an hour to 6 p.m. Definitely. So that we could go join the Hamilton uh, watch party later too. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Are you going to be live tweeting it, girl? I, you know what? I don't know. I'm not good at live tweeting stuff, be mostly because like I, it's hard for me to keep up with the show and try to manage that. At the same, it's just too much going on. So I try sometimes, but by the time I, res I say something like that happened like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, we have the fantastic Vanessa Riley. So I do not uh, generally read bios. I like for people to be able to tell us who they are. So mm -hmm. Vanessa, please tell us a bit about who you are and what you write. I am a, I would say I'm pretty much a history nerd. I love history. I always have particularly European history and history of the West Indies. Um, uh, just even from an early age, just always um, Western Civ classes and whatnot. Um, I'm actually in my bachelor's, I was like two units shy of a, sec of, uh, of a, a concentration in history. Uh, so I, I went with the engineering part. So I went mechanical engineering because that's where the money's at. So, I hear you. <laughs> my mom always <laughs> tell me, tell me, make, make my money first, in, yes. in, and then you can do all this other fun stuff. So <laughs> that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect, perfect sense. Okay, so mm -hmm. I want to jump right into this. So you have plenty of time to tell us everything you want to tell us. So okay. give us the story behind the story of because that's what we like to get at the story behind the story. Mm -hmm. of a Duke, the lady, and the baby. How did you develop the concept for the story itself? Okay. The Typically when I write a book, I find some nugget of history and that the wheels start going and I come up with a story. This one was different. I was literally watching First Wives Club on TV, the old, you know, the old version one, and I just heard of the, the new, that they were going to do a new one on BET, and I was like, oh, yeah, that. Um, but I'm watching them, and I'm like, they need guidance these ladies you know they eventually get their acts together but they go through a journey and i was like there needs to be or something some some figurehead somebody to get them together and to get them on the right page and uh i had just finished uh, a body of uh study and i'm looking at the rights of women within the regency particularly widows uh widows are almost like in first wives club they're like the the discarded wife Mm -hmm. um, and you know the patriarchal society there is really against women so the administering of their widow's dow which is the amount of money that they have to live on every month that comes purely from the delegation of the husband's will well who's going to give the, the husband's will the husband's family and oh. they weren't happy about you marrying right. their son you know they weren't going to exactly make your life easy um, and so that was somewhat the genesis. The other part was three men and a baby, because who doesn't like a man with a baby, yeah, right? I thought that that's where the title, you know? Because <laughs> so I heard that's the first thing I thought of. So I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. So you've got this, a great mashup. So you have Patience Jordan. She is a West Indies heroine. Um, she comes from the colony of Demera. 
she and, and what was the 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 thing was if um wealthy landowners uh wealthy plantation owners would often send their children their biracial uh, children to england for marriage and for education and so patience fits in that journey um she ends up uh, marrying a man who she fell in love with instantly but the marriage doesn't quite work out but patience is trying to do was trying to do everything to make this marriage work so she really lost of uh, herself trying to make this marriage work and unfortunately her husband commits suicide or so she oh, thinks goodness oh oh entry yes. i love it yes um and the evil uncle markham uh patience has a a three-month-old baby mm. a, who's a boy and boys inherit everything it's the right. firstborn right. and the male child gets everything so whoever is in control of the lionel is control of a fortune so mm -hmm. the evil uncle basically uh ships patients off to bedlam making her think she's crazy making everybody think she's crazy mm -hmm. um and he intends to basically collect the money and control everything um he doesn't really care if the baby lives or dies he's gonna do the bare minimum uh because he's really just after the fortune because he's next in line he's the next mm -hmm. man in the in the hierarchy of, of how things inherit but the widow's grace has found out about patience jordan and they have broken her out and patience is literally sneaking into her old house dressed as a man as a footman and sneaking into her baby's nursery and feeding her baby oh, wow. and nursing her about the help that's how i start y'all in the book wow <laughs> wow Wow. <laughs> so she's got to, so the widow's grace is trying to find evidence to prove that the uncle was behind this big conspiracy. So that because at this moment in time, because she's been committed, no one in their right mind, so to speak, would give her custody of her son. And mm, right. the true guardian of her son is the Duke of Reppington. The minute he found out that his cousin died and that there's a baby, he leaves to go off and find this child because he's he's an ex rake because you know aren't they all ex rakes right they are all ex rakes <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, but he's turned he 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 almost has a battlefield conversion he sees something on the battlefield that makes him realize he wants to be a better man and so he wants to take the opportunity to make sure Lionel has every opportunity uh, so he literally. Um, uh, so he's he comes, he gets possession of kids, he, he tosses out Markham, but now Patience has to deal with this Duke, who's the legal custodian of her son. And she's got to find evidence because if she just comes up to him, excuse me, I'm dressed as a footman, but that's my <laughs> baby. Nobody's going to believe it. She's going to get right back up in Bedlam. So right. she's got to, with the widow's grace help, she's got to do this masquerade and they're looking for evidence. Problem is, you know, the Duke wants to make a man of this baby. So he's got crawling practice, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Baby's three months old. Are you serious? <laughs> yep. He's got elocution practice. The baby's three months old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so they butt heads, but sooner they got, they realize they have to join forces in order to find out the, the greater conspiracy, what really happened to her, her husband. And uh, they may just find a happily ever after. Ooh, we love that. We love that. So, okay. The next question I was going to ask you was to delve a little bit into the characters in the story, starting with your West Indian heiress, Patience. And you already told us a little bit about her mm -hmm. and who she is. And was there any um, particular story or character that that inspired this? The, uh, that inspired your character, Patience. Well, the first thing is Patience has no patience, right? <laughs> She, she used it all up trying to make her marriage work um, and literally trying to conform to English society. She's she's done everything. And so she's she's like, I did everything right. And I still get thrown into battle uh, or jacked, as we might say in the present day. <laughs> uh, so she's now trying not to live by anybody's rules. She she wants to uh, she wants to figure this out on her terms. She wants to get custody of her child on her terms, and she is she's ready to roll. She's like England, peace. This is no. I'm going back to Demera, where my boy would be a prince because of how wealthy her father would be. Oh <laughs> my goodness! So she's like, I'm I'm out this mug. I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but uh, she, you know, she has lived for four years trying to be this perfect picture of an English wife, and lived with, uh, you know, uh, everybody saying she wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And patience has to come to realize that she actually is enough. But at the same time, she's not Superwoman. You know, I I'm very much again. Uh, black women, black heroines having to be super women in order to get their happy ever after. So you're going to see patients be vulnerable. You're going to see her be stubborn. She's going to be every aspect of a womanhood that she needs to be to gain her happy ever after. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that you were saying that about being against black women having to be super women um, in order to get their happy ending and in, in their books. And that's so interesting because <laughs> the book that I'm working on right now, that is something that I've been struggling with in my head. Like I, I don't, and I, I agree with you. I don't feel like you can, it, it's, it's people stress themselves out thinking they can have everything. So you could maybe have everything, but not all at once, you mm -hmm. know? So uh, maybe at different seasons of your, of your life, different things are what you would consider necessary for success mm -hmm. and so that's what i'm dealing with with the character i'm writing right now I'm like are people gonna be mad because maybe things are not gonna end for her exactly the way you know they want them to <laughs> but i don't want to perpetuate that whole mm -hmm. idea of the, okay you have to be able to do everything but but we trust you reese we know you're gonna <laughs> give us a, a hot you know uh deeply uh moving characters that really are just going to just you're going to lock in on. So I trust you, girl. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I appreciate that. I I, I, I can use that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Christian Higgins was told me to write scared. Oh, write scared. So you're going to push the storyline as far as you can and just know that your talent will, will meet you there. And it'll Ooh, just I like that. There. I like that. And you know, it, it's so funny you say that about <laughs> Like about pushing, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, look, I'm literally writing that down. My right scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know about pushing because I w I won't lie. Sometimes I write things and I'm like, they're gonna take that out. <laughs> so <laughs> they're gonna take it out. It's, it's gonna be taken out. And I did that in this book that's coming out later this year. I put stuff in and I'm like, you know, just about the reality of what it's like for, for Black people, like in the workplace. You know, um, there's a conversation they have where, where she talks about, um, the heroine talks about sometimes, a lot of times in corporate America, where a Black person is given an opportunity at like, um, or whatever, but with the smallest error, uh, margin of error. So that then if they quote, don't work out, don't work out, you know, then they can say, oh, well, we try. We try. <laughs> There's this whole conversation <laughs> in there. And all a lot of this was written way before everything happened mm -hmm. um, that we're dealing with right now in terms of social unrest and stuff. And so I, I, I was wondering if they were going to take it out. And like none of the stuff that I put in that dealt with race and stuff, did mm -hmm. they even suggest that we take out? So I was really, really happy with that because it's, it's my first book with them. So I didn't know what, you know, what it was going to be like. So yay. <laughs> Okay, so we dealt with patients. So mm -hmm. then let's get into your wounded military hero. It is it Busick? Busick. Yeah, yeah Busick Strathmore. Strathmore. Duke of Reppington. Yes. And so give us a little background on the Duke yes. and what inspired his character and his name. Okay. Let's start with the name first. I have a list of Regency names. And I have, I have a list of the most horrible Regency names because... <laughs> I think they all deserve a happy ever after. So we got Busick on this list. We got Luftus, Solden. Uh, there's some horrible names, but we're gonna try. We're gonna see what we can do and, and just just work it out. But I literally, uh, I have a, a list of authentic names, and I want to names you. I want to try names y'all have never heard of, so that y'all will remember them. And you know, you would remember a man named Busick. I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you definitely are. <laughs> um, musically, as I, we said before, he was he's an ex-rank, but he's like Wellington's man. He is the he was the planner. So when they look at battle tactics and whatnot, that's his role. And he's in the battle of uh, Visage, uh, and 
two things go wrong. Um, he sees something that literally changes his life. Mm. But then he is injured and he has to change his life. And oftentimes we think, hey, you know, I'm I'm ready to turn over a new leaf and whatnot. But his injury literally um, oh, wow. changes his life because he ends up being an amputee after this. He has a he, his leg is amputated. Oh, amputee. So I was going to ask you. You said amputee. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That really um, feels like. You're talking about this is 1814, right? So right. we don't have physical therapists and 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 right. sort of things, but they did have mechanical limbs, and so he's trying to get used to that. Um, he's one of the things when I was writing him, he's a very confident man. He's your typical alpha, but he doesn't want people to look at his to see him through as an injured man or to see him as his injury first as we often do in this able body society. We look at the injury, we look at the disability as opposed to the man. And so he is, he doesn't want you to do that. So he's going through all these links to recapture his life. Everything he was doing before, that's what he wants to do now. Um, and he's led a band of, of fellow wounded soldiers where he's got them in programs, uh, literally uh, drilling, getting them back into their routines uh because that's where his heart is he's trying to make a difference and he's still eyeing if he can get himself back into top physical shape he can go back to war he can go back and be once oh, again wow okay so uh, he's, still, he's still trying to get back into the thing because okay. that. that's right. really a part of his identity and exactly but he yeah. now becomes the guardian of this little boy and he literally falls in love with this little boy and so how do you how do you go back to war when now you're responsible for this infant? So he's got a million things going on in his head. And there's this nanny he just hired who doesn't directly contradict him or go against his orders, but she's so close to that line. <laughs> he's like, something's going on here, right? But at the same time, he's extremely attracted to her, but he's honorable now. You know, like before he might not have, you know. He's honorable now. Like, <laughs> he's honorable now, right? So he wants Everybody to act. Everybody wants a reformed bad boy, right? Yes. He's trying to act honorably because he's like, she's in my employ. So he's got his men saying, do not touch these women in my household. So he's got everybody behaving. But in his head, he's like, Why <laughs> struggle, struggle. So they've got to work through the power dynamics because that was, you know, um, I want to make sure that I'm not putting a message out there that is against my principles, right? And we just came out, you know, I was writing this on the tail end of the, the Me Too wave. Uh, so Great. I was going to ask you about that next, about the power dynamics. Yeah, because I want to, you know, once again, he's he is he's not looking to be reformed. He is reformed. So even though he may have different thoughts in his head, which you are privileged to read, <laughs> he's not going to act on that. So he right. cannot, there's there's things he just cannot do uh, as long as this power dynamic is in place. And so the two of them ne negotiating and navigating that line because she, you know, she's, she becomes, she slowly, you know, she's, she's newly widowed, but the care that she sees him giving to Lionel melts her heart. Uh, and the, and then how he is he the uh, the widow's grace has two um, agents in the household two women so uh, Jamina and Patience are in the household the, how protective he is of those two in the household uh, really because she's come from four years where she wasn't protected mm -hmm. where she pretty much had to fend for herself so she she had money you know, and access and all these sorts of things, but she was literally squirreled away in a, in a country estate while her husband went back and forth to town, and, and which town is London. Uh, and she's, you know, pretty much lived abandoned for m many months of the year, waiting for this husband to come back uh, home. So now she's seeing this man being so present in the life. And so that that changes, changes her perspective on things. Uh, and once again, they've got to figure this out, they've, you know, in the midst of this mystery, because evil uncle still wants that child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evil yeah, uncle yeah. still wants the money. <laughs> and now that he knows that Busick is injured, whoa. Ooh. 
Oh, see, I have books to write, Vanessa Riley. <laughs> and I have this stack of books on my TBR, including yours, that I'm like, I want to read it, but I really, I really, 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 really want to read it. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm already like already on an extension for my book that I'm writing right now. So like, get 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 your book done. Get your book done. The audio I think is coming out in a month. So nice yeah the so rona hit, didn't come on at the same time as the uh the, the rona's the, hit, the rona hit my uh uh the the first selection for uh narrator so mm. had to go through it because they, they want the right person because you know how it is the right yes. narrator yeah. is just just makes everything perfect um and so what, it makes all the difference in the world so yeah. yes yeah, we'd rather wait, wait and get it right than to have it. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that you were writing that in the midst of the whole Me Too situation. And that I think that has changed um, the way we think about workplace romances. And I, I write a lot of work, workplace romances. So. Yes, you do. <laughs> and so in yours, especially, um, so like in mine, a lot of times they're, you know, they're kind of equal or equalish, mm -hmm. you know, even though, no. There was two bosses, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. but definitely in your case, especially, you know, in this particular book by her being, you know, the uh, house servant, basically. And she pretended to be a nanny, right? She's yeah. So nanny. how did you, how did that make you change things in terms of how you negotiated it, that power dynamic? Trying to show the attraction between the two without crossing that line. Because right. you know, normally, if if this was this was the days of old, right? yeah. Yeah. you might see him pulling her her into a corner. There you go. You're back. There you are. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I have a habit of kicking the uh, the power button. My bad. Oh, that's what happened. <laughs> I thought it was me. As long as it's not no, me. it is. Don't be me. My bad. I'm sorry. As long as it's not me to step. <laughs> but what, um, the question you asked was how do how do I about the power me? dynamics yeah. and stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we were if we were reading, writing before the Me Too era, uh -huh. you know, you would see a much because you know an alpha guy in this situation, fully understanding his power, would act upon it. He yeah. might pull her into a, a darkened corner. You might see a, a more intense, um, you know, uh, heavy petting or, or whatnot. But because this is after and the, the clear dynamic of Duke nanny. <laughs> right. You know, Duke is like, you know, there's not very many levels you go higher, you know, in the prince right. and all that sort of stuff. Right. Duke is up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're 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 pretty much you're balanced, right? Well, not well, you're not balanced with the nanny. So he has to be respectful, but at the same time, showing those longing glances, showing how he wishes their circumstances were different, showing you know how he's fascinated by just the smallest things, like the like the way she's she was napping in in a in a chair, <laughs> and next to the the crib, and so he's coming to check on his ward. And he sees her with her feet and, and the little nightgown and everything. And so you you put in these things so you can see how he is intent, how he's growing, this attraction is growing, but at the same right. time, he's not crossing that line. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that because like you said, normally in that situation, especially in reality, mm -hmm. you know, often you know, the housemates and stuff were taken advantage of, <laughs> to say the least. So mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that definitely makes it a little bit more uh, challenging. In how exactly. You with that. So, exactly. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. So anything else about the book itself that you want to tell us about before we start to talk a little bit about some of the, of the craft tools in terms of research? for a historical and i'm excited to, to talk about some of that too because that is on my wish list in case you didn't know vanessa riley i like i love saying your name like the whole name i don't know why <laughs> <laughs> but that is actually one of the things that's on my wish list mm -hmm. of stories that i i like 
kind of crafted out and had set aside for many years is a historical um, series that I want to write. So I am personally very interested in this topic. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Pull it. Yeah, yeah. So do it. it. I, I'm a little selfish, so a lot of times I pick people that I super, super admire and would love to just, you Thank know, you. chat with and Thank want you. answers from. And so that's what I want to talk about. So before, like I said, so is there anything else we want to cover on the book before we... we yes. So we in to- the book, A Duke, the <laughs> latest baby, um, coconut bread plays an extremely important role. And the coconut bread recipe is an adaptation of my grandmother. My grandmother is uh, from uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad. Mm. And my mom, uh, who's from South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Where we get the rally from, boys and girls? <laughs> so we get a little, little, extra, little pieces of the melting pot that is Vanessa Riley. Um, mm. But the recipe is actually included in the oh, back. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Yes, so it's it's a dense pound cake uh, conti- consistency kind of thing, but it's if you cook it all the way through, it it seems like it takes a long time. But trust me, that middle won't be done. Mm. <laughs> it won't be done. So do it, take it long, and poke the middle. Um, but food is very important, and you, well, you know, food is very important to me. Yes. And, being able to add uh, this recipe that's a, once again an adaptation of my Trinidadian grandmother and my mama mama here in South Carolina um, is was was a joy to put together uh, for the for this for for the book and coconut bread is very important. That's all I gotta say. You know, I, I think it's really cool that you did that. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that readers love. And I just was at a um, book discussion for um, the book I, that came out before um, my release yesterday, and that was uh, Candidly Yours, it's a novella, but it dealt with Caribbean carnival culture. Mm-hmm. And so they travel to the different places in the Caribbean and go to these different carnivals. Yeah. And, you know, food, in every book of mine, food is a big part of it, because, you know, I love, I love to eat. That should be no mystery. <laughs> so, so, but food and music always play a big part in everything I do. And so, if that's one of the things that the the book club was saying, I wish you had to put some of these recipes in the book. <laughs> so, I know your readers are glad that you did that. Yeah. That you put is that is it just that one recipe that's in there? Just that one recipe. So there's you know one. As we go through the series, there'll be one spotlight, one signature dish. Nice. That's my idea right now. So that will be in the book. So that nice. the readers can 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 participate and make that dishes. And you know, tag me on Instagram if y'all make some of this stuff. I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> that would be super cool, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. That was where's what was one other thing I wanted to ask you about the title. And that is, did you come up with that title or did they? I came up with that title. Okay. If it's oh, a corny, yeah, that's awesome. Because you know, it doesn't if, often happen that way. If it's an unusual title, slightly corny, it's <laughs> fully 100% Vanessa Riley. Totally. <laughs> totally, 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 totally. Totally. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny because it's like there's only one book that I've had traditionally published mm-hmm. that they actually kept my title, and I was like super surprised. I was like, really? Because I remember asking at one point, I'm like, you know, so what title do we settle on? When they told me it was the title I actually gave them, I couldn't even believe it. But that's like <laughs> one time out of all the books I've, I've written when it was when it wasn't like in um, an indie. But we do have a question. Mm-hmm. She read. He said has mm-hmm. this question. Will we get to meet Patience sisters in future books? Sort of. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't want to spoil it, but everybody who reads the, to the end will know why I'm saying sort of, you know, because there's a, there's, I left some threads, you know, I left some threads open at the end. And one of the big questions is what happened to Patience's sisters? Mm, okay, nice, so nice. that that's one thing. Um, t- Tony, there are three books in. The, I like how it just pops up on a thing. I Tony, know, right? Tony, there are three <laughs> books in the series, and I've already seen the cover for the second book, which is the Earl, a girl, and a toddler. Oh, sweet! 
Okay, and let me just ask the question out loud for anybody who might like be working and listen to this in the replay and just working and not here. Yeah. The question that Tony Robinson asked was, "How many books are in this series?" And so mm -hmm. Vanessa said, "There are three. Yes. And I love that title. So that title was that title you two? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and I that's love like it. I love it. So are all of them going to have that similar kind of a uh, naming yes. convention? Okay, yes. I like it. I like it. Because when we named the first book in my Bourbon Brothers series, they were like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll use this title and we can use that as a naming convention. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, we didn't do that again. <laughs> every other, every book is different. <laughs> so, so that's cool. Well, the, the, um, it should be out um, I don't, um, in 2021. Um, and this one will have the, the Earl. You met the Earl in A Duke, The Lady and the Baby. There's a barrister, a Blackamoor barrister, who's been elevated by the time of the next book. So you're going to see a Blackamoor Earl is the Earl. Nice, nice. Okay, so it's three books in the series, yes. and you already got the title. Have you seen your cover for your new one, did you say? I just saw it. it yeah, it, so you just saw Okay, so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the point of what should be revealed. Yes, yes. Do do Thank we know when we'll be able to see that cover? I don't know. <laughs> that's always fun seeing those covers, you yeah. know. Yeah. So how and so with the cover, the original, the cover that you have now, mm -hmm. how many uh, iterations did it go to through before <laughs> we got the final cover? It was pretty dead on the first time. Um, there was just little tweaks uh, and font and and uh, name placement and and things like that. Uh, but it was pretty spot on the first time. Um, we wanted to go with a bold concept. We wanted it to be something you picked it up and you were like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, the, this, the uh, Kensington uh, loves, loved the series, loved the concept. And when we were going through, when we were thinking of cover designs, that's when illustrated covers had just kind of started to peak. Um, and so we, we went for broke. We, you know, this is, this, is, this is a different type of historical. So let's go with a different type of historical cover. Cause you know, normally I have the beautiful clinches and the, mm -hmm. and, and the women on the, the cover, you know, beautiful gowns and whatnot. But this time I was like, let's, let's go for something different. Something that's, that's going to attract attention because we're a different type of historical. We want to we want to get it out there. We want as many people to read it, uh, to see a different perspective on the history. Because most of the times, people only you know have very limited views of what uh, black people uh, how they lived during these particular ages. They they only think of slavery or they think of the BC time frame when we were kings and queens. Mm -hmm. Africa, they, that whole diaspora in between the migration from the Caribbean to various parts of the world, it's totally, it, it's not seen here very much right. in the States. Um, and so I'm trying to get these stories because they're there. Girl, there's some stuff. It's, I, there's, there's like, a, there's like forever level of books from just some of the nuggets I've dug, I've dug up down there. Oh, in, that is in, awesome. In, okay, so well, that is a perfect segue into hold on so let me just make sure it's no uh, oh yes tony says that the color grabs you on uh this book it absolutely does i mean it's it just pow it hits you in the face mm -hmm. <laughs> and definitely i agree like it, it, it's a different cover than you're used to seeing on uh, a historical and it definitely is attention grabbing so yes. i loved that so much so that is a perfect segue for us to get into. And for everybody watching, if you have other questions, feel free to pop them in and I will come back to them. And yes, I'm a blind as a bat. That's why I keep putting my glasses back on. <laughs> okay. Ooh. So there's a question from Tam Jernigan. Would you ever write a time travel historical? She asks. Ooh. That could always be a possibility, right? Um, but then I have to work on my contemporary voice. Uh, mm, yes. That's true, because when you do a time travel, you have to nail them both. Yes. Very much so. So it's, it, it, as, as you have shown, it's, it's to do it right, 
that's it's it's effort. Even though we speak contemporary speak, that's not the same as what goes into a book. And so right. being able to balance the contemporary plus the historical is an interesting challenge, at least for me. I've got to work on my contemporary muscle because it, it, every every time you write a specific di a dialect or, or in a time frame, it's a muscle, right? And you can't yes. have somebody just, I'm going to pontificate. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not going to happen, right? This, this is, I mean, it's so funny because it just reminds me of, of the times we got a chance to hang out together at uh, uh, Regional like, camera action. Yes. <laughs> years of it. So I'm like, I, I feel like I'm just like at, at. Yeah, no, we would have been playing space. Where, where, was that place, where was that place? Cracker Barrel. Yes, 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 yes. Cracker Barrel. Right, right, right. With the, with the cute waiter. I remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> so we're going to. Um, shift into the question of for readers and aspiring authors out there who dream of one day writing their own fabulous historical novel, let's get into your three top tips for researching a historical romance. Okay. The first tip is a mindset. Never believe never. Okay. Many people who think they know the history will tell you no one's ever done that. That's never happened. Never, ever, ever believe never. Um, because that will stop your story. And it'll stop you from going and, and searching for the truth because you have to know the truth, right? There, there, there are times where, you know, some people will, will make things up for the second story. They'll, they'll come up with, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Right. Um, but from my lens, I want to try and base all of my stories on history because once again, I'm a history nerd. Uh, <laughs> as you know, in every one of my books, I learned very early on that I'm gonna have author's notes. So you don't have to believe me. <laughs> Here's all the reference. <laughs> um, and document, oh, that's okay. Here's a side note, <laughs> document your references uh, where you find stuff because you <laughs> never find it again. Yeah, yeah. And let me ask you a side question on that, because what you said about doing the author's notes, and I've heard other authors talk about this a lot. Let me say this. I've heard a lot of other Black historical authors talk about the fact that they feel like they are challenged more often and more vehemently by readers who feel like they are getting whatever wrong. And so that's another reason why a lot of times they have author notes in the book. Do you Have you found that as well? Absolutely. Um, but look at it this way. They're reading your book and they uh, are enjoying it. There's there are no there's not another point where they are more open to understanding more inclusive history, uh, the dynamics of history than the point at which they finish your book, because you've presented them with all kind of ideas. And they're in this question state, was this author, was the author just, you know, is this author's fiction? Is it fantasy? Is it based on truth? They're so open at that point. So I want to make it easy for you. Here are my author's notes. Here is where I'm getting things from. Here's terms you can look up if need be. Because you're, a reader is, 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 is the most open when they've read your book, they liked your book. Um, and I, you know, you, you get, you get, uh, reviews that say, you know, I Googled this and she was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. So, and it'll, 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 it will, you know, it, it, there's so much disinformation. There's so much, uh, just wrong stuff that gets propagated over and over and over again that you know set the record straight these are my references this is this is where i'm getting stuff these are you know google for yourself and yeah. and figure out you know what was true and what was was not true and whatnot so yeah i'm a big fan of the author's note awesome awesome so never believe never is mm -hmm. your first tip and what is tip number two tip number two never base your world on fiction or tv Ooh. okay you know unless it's by henry gates 
more than likely, there may have been some corners cut on that historical side, and they're presenting a great story. Um, I love Pride and Prejudice A and E version, right? Mm -hmm. I've watched that thing. I, I think I should have like a Guinness World Record the number of times I've watched that thing, right? See, so you, you're my people because yes. that's, that's my jam. The A and E. The yes, six, and that is the best version for those of you who are listening online who have differing opinions. The AD version is the best. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. I, I and I'm gonna agree 100. Colin Firth is the only Mr. Darcy for me. I am yes. sorry. It's totally, not even a question. Totally, totally there. Don't at me. Yes. <laughs> but not even a question. I'm sorry. Oh but no, no, no. But but, but that does not just him. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Ely, I think it is, who plays that. You know. Elizabeth, yes. Bennett, she is my heart. That's just, yes. yes. I'm She's sorry. Perfect. I'm not saying I don't have anything against Kara, Kara Knightley and all of that. I like her and stuff, yes. but she just is not Jennifer Ely. I am sorry. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, yes. But, yes. you know, if you base your world on that, you're going to have uh, no people of color at all in the story. Mr. Darcy is wandering through London looking for Lydia and Wickham. And he should see one person of color on that street because they were there. There were mm. 20,000 free blacks living in London during the time of Jane Austen. Wow. And you don't see that, right? Wow. So, no, you would ne yeah. never see that on those in those books ever, ever. Yeah. You would never know that. So. Uh, I mean, they just, I um, uh, don't know if it was Annie, but somebody just did um, Sanditon, which was Jane Austen's last book. Yes. Wealthiest woman in the book is Miss Lamb, the mulatto from the West Indies. Mm. She got so much money, they are scheming on that poor girl to marry her, right? Ooh. Yeah, right. I have that listed in my, my wish list on I think it's PBS Masterpiece. Yes, they did they did a great job. Okay. I, I'm well, they added right some now. things. Okay, I'm just they added some stuff that I don't remember reading. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, always. Yeah, That's always the case. <laughs> but if you base your world on another author's work, even my work, I mean, that's why I'm saying test everything, Google everything, um, you know, do your own research because authors sometimes uh, may invent stuff. You know, Hayer made up stuff. Georgette Hare made up stuff. Georgette Hare has a bias. Uh, against Jewish people that comes out in some of her books. Ooh. So, you know, yeah. you can't that you cannot uh, trust that to build your world. Mm -hmm. right? It can excite your world. TV, you know, TV shows, it can excite your world. It could get you raring and, and thinking about historicals. But you got to do your research. You got to go out there and, and, and find the facts that you want to build in your world. Um, That's last Point because oh, okay. a lot of for a lot of us, you know, that might be the thing that inspires you to write a story or whatever. And so you're basing that whole thought process on that. And you might be in like kind of a cliff notes mindset where you're like, okay, instead of reading all the history books or doing this research, I'm just gonna watch these movies. <laughs> and that makes so much sense in why why it's a bad move, A, mm -hmm. and why it's you know limiting B. You yes. know, and just so many other possibilities could be opened up by you reading the history for yourself and deciding what's important. Because that's another thing. Those things filter what's important, like you said, about no people of color being on those streets of London when he's looking in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So that would just open up a whole world. So, yeah, that is an excellent, excellent tip exactly. reminder. <laughs> exactly. Um, the last tip is re do the research and you know, start with Google. Google is your basic friend, right? It'll, it'll point you different places. Often it'll point you to my website because if you're doing Regency, I've got an exhaustive list of resources on my website, vanessarally.com. Um, the wikis are great, but some of the wiki entries are user entries. So trust, but verify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Google Books is a great one particularly because you can find books in the period, written and published during the period that you're, you're researching. Yes. Uh, yes. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you want to see, you want to see writings of that period. You want to look at um, photo, not photographs, but paintings and sketches of that period, mm. because that's going to just, 
that'll blow your mind and you'll get so many different story ideas from something you've seen in a painting, something you've seen in newsprint. Um, if you if the air now if you go back certain, you're gonna have to, you know, it gets a little harder the, the farther you go back. Uh, but the um, the archive societies, I'm always in the UK archive society um, uh, and the libraries uh, and the museums now have online components. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my friend, Denny Bryce, <laughs> my friend, Denny Bryce, she tipped me up to talk, you know, sending in those uh, ask the librarians. Librarians, y'all are the y'all are the stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. y'all will dig up things. Uh, get access to things, uh, send us things, PDFs, uh, pictures, you name it. Librarians are your friends. So those are your routes to get started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do basic research just to kind of, you know, figure things out. Um, Google books for periods, books within the, the actual given period, um, uh, you know, and, and then the, the archives, whether it's the library archives, the museum archives, or even their specialty archives. Like I'm always in um, the Old Bailey's. Old Bailey's is the crime files uh, for London. And Ooh. I go back, yeah, so I'll go back. Oh, I can see five. why that would be just a gold mine. Yes, yes. Found I found a case recently where uh, the Blackmore man was cleared of stealing a Bible. <laughs> no. Yes. Somebody had, trunk fell off of uh fell off, fell off of a wagon, and the woman claimed that he this this man stole her Bible and trunk. And through the court testimony, they figured out that the trunk had fallen off the wagon and it was just left there. And finders keepers was the rule. <laughs> wow! So he was cleared of charges. So much fascinating history there, and, and the so the tips you know like I, I always in thinking about writing the series that I want to write, I knew, okay, yeah, I need to write, um, read contemporary um, uh, things that were written in that time period. Mm -hmm. But I never thought about the information you could glean from like what, from paintings and sketch. I would have never thought of that. I was just mm -hmm. thinking of like reading those books and stuff. So that's a really interesting tip that I had not thought about before in terms of, doing research. It, it was there a particular um, painting or drawing that as you were researching this book that struck you or it's stuck not, with you? Not this book, but the next book I have coming out in May of 2021, Island Queen. Mm. Um, looking at the pictures of, of enslaved women of color mm. and then looking at the pictures of paintings of free women of color I have now realized why hats are so important. Remember the big church hats? We don't, they, they lo they've lost something now, right? Mm -hmm. like big church hats and the, and the wearing of a hat was extremely important to our great, great grandmothers because that symbolized your economic status and power. Mm -hmm. So the big church hat women, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. There's okay. a reason, right? There's so a reason. So much fascinating information. I, I love that. And Tony Robinson was agreeing earlier about movies leaving out a great deal, and it's better to do your own research as a reader. I, she said, I love to double check because I learn more. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that when stories, you know, spark your imagination or your interest in a certain topic or whatever, and now you're off learning all kinds of new stuff. Exactly. Of interest. And especially as a writer, that's just mine and that's just more information for you to <laughs> dig into as far as writing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Can you speak oh can you can you speak to any inspiration plans from your research into Dorothy Kerwin Thomas? Yes. Okay. Dorothy Kerwin Thomas is one of the most amazing women that I have ever had the fortune of discovering. Um I literally about somewhere between six to six, about 10 years ago, I found um, a, a political cartoon, right? So a political cartoon. Um, and it's a Prince William Henry and he's in a hammock and, it, and with a black woman, right? So Prince William Henry, who goes on to be William the fourth, you know, King William the fourth of England 
is drawn with a, a black woman and they're all snuggled up, all booed up in a hammock. <laughs> right? Now it's a political cartoon. So you've got to say how much of this is true, how much of this is right. False, right. Right. But the odd thing was when they usually drew a woman of color, a black woman, they made her garish when it was in these these things, right? The big lips, they would exaggerate yeah. big but this woman is drop dead gorgeous. That's when I knew there was a story here, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they weren't just making up somebody. This was somebody specific that they drew in this cartoon. Mm -hmm. So about six years ago, I came across, you know, in one of these deep dives, looking for something totally else, I came across the name of Dorothy Kerwin Thomas. And as I rooted through, I found out that she and Prince William had a little thing going on mm. on the island of Dominica. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, it fits the time frame, it fits the boat, the imagery in that particular, the, the sketch that I found. And then I started digging up uh, into this woman. Dorothy Kerwin Thomas was born about 1756 time frame. She literally, she's enslaved, um, beautiful, dark skinned woman, enslaved woman, but she was mulatto because her, her father was massive, right? Uh -huh. um, she, is able to work even while she's enslaved because this is the Caribbean enslavement is slightly different than American <laughs> enslavement. They had days off. Mm. Okay, that, that was very that different was for me, right? right. Mm. <laughs> and literally, because she was Massa's daughter, she could go to town and sell goods. So she would go to town and she would sell things to in the market square and whatnot. And so she keeps earning money so that she earns enough money over the course of time so that she's able to free herself her mother and her sis uh, and her sister and her daughters, her sister, her sister and daughters. Um, and she goes on uh, to continue to build wealth. So she becomes one of the wealthiest women in the West Indies. Uh, she builds hotels and she has a French chef. So we're talking about now probably circa 1805. Enslavement is, is going, you know, wild and crazy here in the United States. She, is building hotels, having a French chef come in to cater to guests. Um, there is a whole set of colored women, black women that I found that have that are that are wealthy, that are free, that have gotten themselves out of enslavement, you know, bought their freedoms, etc., uh, and are doing great things. Um, Dorothy has an affair with uh, 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 Prince William, and she goes on to end up saving the women of her time because people were looking, right? And all these black women with all this money and, and power and influence. So when there's a massive slave rebellion in uh, Demera, they want the black women to pay for it, all the damages. Wow. You know, even though properties was damaged across the, the, the gambit, you know, from all the landholders, they wanted the black women to pay for it because Sooner or later, uh, Dorothy realized that if they kept changing laws to target black women, that they'd figure out a way to take all their money or even worse, cancel those manumissions so they would be enslaved again. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So she literally goes from Demer, which is Guy which is present day Guyana, which is way below the, the equator. She travels all the way to England and forces a meeting with Lord Baptist, who was uh, the, the secretary of war and the colonies and literally convinces him how unfair this tax is. This woman is so dynamic. That conversation leads him to abolish the tax. She goes back basically saving the generational wealth of all the black free women in Demera. Wow. Her name has been wiped away from the roll books. Why? Because she doesn't fit the narrative that uh -huh. everybody uh -huh. thinks of when they think of us during the 1800s. Uh, she, she's just pa a powerful woman. So I have the privilege and honor to tell her story. Her story, who this woman, <laughs> all I gotta say is there's, there's romances with an S <laughs> in this book. Um, it's, it's my first hardcover. It's coming out by, uh, Harper Collins, William Morrow, uh, in 2021 called Island Queen. Uh -huh. And I think you guys, it's, 
it's my hope that it changes the perspective because if you understand that we all weren't enslaved, that we all, that we may have been victimized, but we rose from it to become and to come and take a seat at the table or build your own table as she did often, it changes, I think, perspective. It, I think it opens up doors about who we think we can be in the future because a lot of the powerful women have been erased. And I think it's, yeah. it's purposeful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very purposeful. So. Okay. That was a fantastic question. <laughs> and I, and I, and look, I'm, I'm super excited for Island Queen now. Yes. Okay, so let me, as we wrap up, Tony Robinson, about the, you mentioned about the hat. I still wear yes. hats today and love them. Tony, wear that hat with pride. Matter of fact, send me a picture of it. <laughs> it's Mama Tony. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I, that is fascinating history. Mm -hmm. And since we're down to just a few minutes, because, you know, we got to go get our um, Hamilton watch party on. So let me just recap your three uh, tips. And number one tip for researching a historical book, never believe never, mm -hmm. which I thought was excellent, <laughs> to never base your world on fiction or TV. Another excellent tip. And do the research. <laughs> and I think that's a good tip. Like that might seem so basic. Like I'm asking you about research, but trying to find those shortcuts or mm -hmm. just taking somebody else's word. Yes. You know, or even just even just reading one book in the period and saying, hey, I'm going to base everything off this one book. Well, you just don't ever know because it's the oppressors who usually write history, right? So Reese, you, if you, you don't so study widely, widely or, yeah, if you don't search widely, you're going to get that one perspective mm -hmm. and it could be a complete and total lie. You know, just think about some of the books that are being written now political books, depending on which, where, you know, who wrote that book, mm -hmm. it can be a complete bag of lies, like provable lies that people are putting forth as the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, like, girl, it, girl, girl, girl. Uh, several of the books that I, when I was doing this research on Dorothy, I'd, I'd find her name mentioned in snippets. And one of them tried to say that she had a relationship with her half brother, Massa's son. Okay, let's focus on this, right? A relationship. She's owned by Massa. Do we really think it was a relationship? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. But the victor writes the history. That's right. And so instead of admitting that, oh, she was forcibly raped because she was enslaved during that time frame, they rather call it a, a relationship. Right. So do your research and, and think about the lens at which it was written, because, um, you know, it, I'm so excited about this, about you thinking about writing a historical, about this new wave of people writing historicals, because there is something when you're writing about your ancestors, when you're writing about, um, you know, your blood because it's all our blood, right? And you're writing about that and you're giving it life and you're setting the record straight in a lot of ways and empowering with it. I think that is so freeing and it, it's got to be done. But once again, that's, you know, when you do research, you get to bring you into the research and you analyze, yes. does this actually bode well for what we know now on the ground, right? Does it, does it bode well? I love it. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Vanessa Riley. Vanessa Riley. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I like to get super country when I say that. You got to. That, that, that's the mama's side, right? Mama's side is, is Sakilada. Daddy said, So you get. Thank you so much for coming and spending some time with us. And oh, it's my pleasure. About to look, show us that gorgeous cover one more time before, on our way out. Damn. So. You know, it's available at all retailers. Make sure you pick this book up because it sounds fascinating. And I can't wait to read it once I get my writing done. So it's thank you for being And, and in the street. description below, you will find information to follow to Vanessa's website to learn more about her and her fascinating books. And I can't wait for Island Queen in 2021. Do we know when exactly in 2021? 
May 2021 is current slot, but it can, it can shift. Right, because everything's going. So thank you again, Vanessa, for being here with us. And thank, thank you, you everybody who came and who, uh, you know, was here live and contributed. We, we appreciate you so much. And for everybody who's listening in, in playback, thank you as well. Post your questions. If you have questions for Vanessa, and I'll make sure they get to her. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And everybody go enjoy Hamilton. <laughs> Bye, guys. And thank Bye. you. Take care. <laughs> Bye.